Oasis is definitely maybe is in my opinion an album that tells a story and backing this idea up Noel Gallagher has talked about the inspiration behind the album's lyrics in many places down through the years. Here's what Noel Gallagher said about that album to Mojo. That album was about the angst of being a teenager in 1977. Fast forward to 1994 and definitely maybe is about the glory of being a teenager. It's an honest snapshot of working class lads trying to make it. It's about shagging birds, taking drugs, drinking and the glory of all that. And that completely lines up with what I've always thought about the album. But it could be a little more personal than that. Rather than just a snapshot of youth in general, this album could be seen as Noel Gallagher's own experience as a young man growing up poor in Manchester. I wonder if, rather than this just being a kind of general concept album, this is actually a personal snapshot, almost like a diary, of Noel Gallagher's youth. He seemed to confirm this idea in a 1995 interview with Rolling Stone, where he said, The whole of the first album is about escape. It's about getting away from the shitty, boring life of Manchester. The first album is about dreaming of being a pop star in a band. The second album is about actually being a pop star in a band. So, there you have it. By Noel's own account, both of the first two albums were kind of autobiographical in nature. They were about what he was dreaming of and what was actually happening to him in the real world, in real time. There were time capsules, freeze frames in song of exactly what was going on in the life of Noel, the songwriter, in each phase of his life. And, according to Noel in other interviews, that actually applies to all three Oasis albums released in the 90s. Definitely Maybe was about the band hoping to make it. Morning Glory was when the sun had at last begun to rise over their dreams, and Be Here Now was about hitting the top and actually being the biggest band in the world. You can even see the progression of that story just from the album titles alone. And when you look at what those albums were written about, and then look at what happened in the actual historical record, I don't think any other band or artist has ever pulled off what Oasis did with that trilogy. Those songs could all be seen, if you chose to, as being about real things, real people, and real history. In a previous video, I've put together a theory about the meaning behind What's the Story Morning Glory. But today, I want to have a dig under the surface of Definitely Maybe, to try and break down what the story being told on that album actually is, if you choose to see one there at all. Now, I have a theory that I've talked about on this channel loads of times, that many of the best rock and roll albums can be kind of broken down into three distinct acts. And of course, this isn't fact, it's just my interpretation. But if you chose to, this is how you could see the three acts of Definitely Maybe. Tracks one to four are act one, the childhood dream. Tracks five to eight are act two, the band starting to see glimpses of success. And tracks nine to 11 are act three, songs about Louise. When you start to look at the lyrics, even though there is some nonsense in amongst it all, it's amazing to see how many of the songs really do seem to be grouped by theme. You can see that at a glance just by looking at those last three songs on the album. The only tracks on the whole of Definitely Maybe talking about a romantic relationship are all clustered together, songs 9, 10 and 11, in a row, right at the end. So now, let's get stuck in. Let's take a look at this hypothetical Act 1, tracks 1 to 4. I'm going to call Act 1, The Rock and Roll Dream. In Track 1, Rock and Roll Star, Noel says, I live my life in the city, but there's no easy way out. I live my life for the stars that shine. People say it's just a waste of time. In my mind, my dreams are real. Tonight, I'm a rock and roll star. And there's really not a lot of mystery about what this song means. The album opens up with a young Noel dreaming of everything he wants to be. He's a young lad in Manchester looking for a way to break free of the ordinary life that most of his peers just end up living in. But here, in the Statement of Intent, the opening track of the album, we find out he has a dream, and we find out what that dream is. In the next song as well, Shaker Maker, we have literal snapshots of him in his life as a teenager. This song is apparently literally named after a toy in the 70s that he remembered from his own childhood. And it famously has at least one line that is just openly autobiographical. Mr Sifter sold me songs when I was just 16. This, of course, is true. Noel would go and buy his records from a local record shop called Sifters. And so there you can see in both tracks one and track two, 
this idea of a young man, 16 years old, dreaming of escaping Manchester and becoming a rock star. And of course, Knowles told us in interviews that that's exactly where he was at that time. In Live Forever, track three, we see this theme continuing clearly in the lyrics. More of Noel imagining what he might become and that sense of absolute determination starting to grow in him. Maybe I just want to fly. I want to live. I don't want to die. Maybe you're the same as me. We see things they'll never see. You and I are going to live forever. Maybe I will never be all the things that I want to be. Now is not the time to cry. Now's the time to find out why. So in song three, we are still with him as a young man. He has the dream, but he hasn't achieved it yet. But he wants to fly, he wants to live forever. And that line, maybe I will never be all the things I want to be, is quite a key line to this album. The whole question of will he make it, won't he make it, runs as a theme all the way through the album. Now song four, Up in the Sky, Noel has said various different things about. One perspective on this song that he's given in interviews is that it's about a young working class lad looking up at powerful people like politicians, saying that they don't understand what life is like, for ordinary people down on the ground. But in another place, he said it was about looking up at your musical heroes and recognising that they've kind of lost touch with their roots. Here's what he said to Melody Maker. It's basically about people who think they're the voice of a generation or the figurehead of a movement. It's just saying, why are you locked down here looking up at him? This band is about the music. It's about the songs. It's not about us. So if we interpret Up in the Sky as being about a young man looking up at musical heroes who are kind of spearheading a movement, once again, it fits. All four songs in my hypothetical first act of the album are written from the perspective of someone young with nothing to their name, looking up at the skies and dreaming of being up in the sky as well. All these opening four tracks on the album are shot through with the theme of this painful, poverty-stricken existence. And every track as well talks about forgetting the past and embracing a glittering future. All of these songs are about escape, about looking up and aspiring to be up there rather than down here. So there it is. That's what I consider the first act of the album. But that's not all. In my previous video where I talked about What's the Story Morning Glory, I also mentioned how the B-sides from that era line up eerily well, in consecutive order with the album tracks from that era. And, as I was putting this video together, I noticed something. Although they don't fit together in quite the same fascinating, coincidental way as the B-sides from the Morning Glory era, you can kind of do a similar thing, story-wise, with the stuff from Definitely Maybe as well. It's not absolutely perfect, but you can, nonetheless, do it again in almost exact chronological order. So, starting with this first act, Let's put the four album tracks from Definitely Maybe on one side and the first four new original B-sides on the other. And now let's look at the lyrics to see if we can find any connection, any similarities in theme. Do these songs fit together? Let's start with Rock and Roll Star, track one. That's a song all about escaping Manchester, getting out of the dirty, polluted city and beginning a new and better life. Now look at these lyrics from the first Oasis B-side, Take Me Away. It's time to be all the things that we are wishing away for another day. Because me and my soul, we know where we're going. We're going where the grass is free, the air is clean and the good times are growing. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? You could see both of those songs as being about exactly the same thing. Escaping the city and getting away to a new life. It's just my opinion, but I think they fit quite nicely. You could see Rock and Roll Star as the opening chapter of the album, The Statement of Intent. And then in the first B-side, we see that exact same statement of intent. Take Me Away was the first B-side on the first Oasis single, Supersonic. But there was also a second original B-side on that release. So now let's go on to look at the second track from the album and that second B-side, I Will Believe. In track two on the album, we have Noel saying he wishes he was someone else and could forget his past. I'd like to be somebody else and not know where I've been. I'd like to build myself a house out of plasticine. He wants to build a new life for himself, one which, right now, is just make-believe. It's a house made out of plasticine. And now, here's a few lines from I Will Believe, the next B-side in chronological order. 
which, once again, seems to continue and develop that same theme of being young, hopeless and just completely lost. Locked up in chains for the rest of my life, there's no one else to blame but me. The start of the day is just the end of the night, I'm feeling like I'm lost at sea. But when I find my own peace of mind, I will believe. You could interpret this opening section as him just being a lost young man wandering the streets of Manchester with no idea what his future might look like. He's searching for his way of escape, he's searching for the key, but he just doesn't know what it is. And, once again, look at the parallels between the lyrics in Shaker Maker and I Will Believe. Shaker Maker says, I'm sorry but I just don't know. I know I said I told you so, but when you're happy and you're feeling fine, then you'll know it's the right time. Put that next to these lines from I Will Believe, and you can see they're both expressing, once again, the exact same sentiment. Right now, at this point in the story, life is shit and he's searching for a way out, but he hasn't figured out what he's going to do just yet. So now, let's move on to the next pair of songs in chronological order. The next B-side comes from the Shaker Maker single, and it's a song called Do You Wanna Be A Spaceman? And as you've probably anticipated by now, to me at least, this once again seems to fit in like a jigsaw piece. Listen to these lyrics and how they fit in perfectly with the theme of perseverance, persistence and hanging on to your dream, even when everyone else is giving up. I haven't seen your face around since I was a kid. You're bringing back those memories of the things that we did. Hanging round and climbing trees, pretending to fly. Do you want to be a spaceman and live in the sky? You've got how many bills to pay and how many kids, and you forgot about the things that we did. The town where we're living has made you a man, and all of your dreams are washed away in the sand. It's funny how your dreams change as you're growing old. You don't want to be no spaceman, you just want the gold. All the dream stealers are lying in wait, but if you want to be a spaceman, it's still not too late. Once again, it just couldn't fit in any better with the theme so far, could it? Let's compare those lyrics with the partner track, Live Forever. Live Forever talks about, I just want to fly. And here in the corresponding song, Noel asks an old friend, don't you want to live in the sky anymore? And then, of course, we go straight into the next song, Up in the Sky. And the corresponding next B-side is a song called Alive, which I personally view as kind of closing off the first act. For this to work, this final song has to kind of round off everything in the first act and then leave us on the edge of our seats with a little bit of tension before the start of the second. So, let's take a look at the lyrics and see if they deliver. The people have noticed that the times are changing. But are they going to be something now? I think I've seen you all hesitating. I think I'll go and be something now. Is it time to doubt? Is it time to wait? Will you be left alone at the starting gate? I'm not blind, and I don't mind, because I've got time. Now I'm alive. Noel's mind has been made up. He spent much of his childhood gazing up at the stars, so to speak, and here in the last song of this first act he says, I've seen you all hesitating, but I'm going to go and be something now. And so, on that cliffhanger, the first act stops, the curtain falls, we all go out and grab a pint, and wait for the second act to begin. So here's the progression so far. The first two songs are the opening statement of intent, the introduction to the story. He's dreaming of escaping Manchester. The next pair of songs are Noel as a lost child who feels trapped and can't see a way out yet. He did have a very difficult childhood, so this lines up. The third pair of songs are him a little older. He now knows what he wants to be and he's seeing his friends who also used to have dreams succumbing to ordinary life. And the final pair of songs talk about looking up and deciding the time has come to do something about getting there. Now, at this point, we do have to ask the question, have these tracks all been arranged intentionally to tell this story? If these tracks all fit together so well, was this planned by Noel? I think, honestly, probably not. Rather than creating a piece of pretty kind of far out content this time, I thought I would just say what I actually think. It seems to me that what actually happened was, at this time in his life, Noel thought about little else. If we view these songs as an accurate insight into kind of his mindset at the time, he does seem kind of like a man possessed. I reckon, judging by history and the way he actually pursued this rock and roll dream in real life, often at the expense of all else, we could say that these songs fit together simply because it was all there was space for in Noel's head 
when he was writing them. I think he was just obsessed with the idea of becoming a rock star, and so that theme just bled out into every line of lyrics he wrote. Of course, it could have been intentional that the songs all fit together this way, or it could just have been happy coincidence. Personally, I don't know, but you can make your own mind up as we go along. Let's move on now to Act 2 of Definitely Maybe, which I'm going to call Glimpses of Glory. So, this second act of Definitely Maybe, I see as songs 5, 6, 7 and 8. And again, it's just my opinion, but I would see them as being less about Noel's childhood dreams, and much more about the early days of the band themselves. It seems to me that in all these songs, Noel is openly, or cryptically, talking about the band getting little glimpses of what could be just down the road. Tiny little moments where they see what could be the rock and roll dream actually coming true. Song 5 is Columbia, which says, There we were, now here we are. All this confusion, nothing's the same to me. I can't tell you the way I feel, because the way I feel is oh so new to me. What I heard is not what I hear. I can see the signs, but they're not very clear. So you can see how we were left on that cliffhanger with the song Alive that said, The times are changing. And here, in Columbia, that theme is picked up and continued. Everything's changed, everything's new. And that fits because, historically speaking, the band, at this time, were at last starting to get a little momentum. They were taken under the wing of signed Liverpool band The Real People, who recorded them in their Bootle studio, helped them develop their sound, and produced their first serious demo. The song Columbia was actually co-written with the Griffiths brothers from The Real People, and so, to me at least, it represents that time in their history. Change actually was in the air. And now, let's look at the next chronologically released B-side. The next new original B-side is one of my favourites, it's Cloudburst, from the Live Forever single. So now let's do what we've done with every song so far, and compare the lyrics in the album track to the corresponding lyrics in the B-side. On Columbia, we've just had loads of references to everything changing, everything being new, and here in Cloudburst we get Wake up, there's a new day dawning. I think I'll take a little walk for a while. They look but they cannot find me, I'm often heading for the sun. The wind that brings on the change is taking me over. You see how that links perfectly to Columbia? Two songs talking about everything being new, everything suddenly changing. Hope is on the horizon. We could therefore realistically look at this as the moment where Oasis got signed to Creation Records. And that was, historically speaking, the next major event in the band's life after recording their demo with the real people. The next track on the album, Song 6, is Supersonic. Unlike Columbia, we actually know how this song was written. Columbia was a co-write with The Real People, and Supersonic was written by Noel in the Pink Museum studio in Liverpool in between 10 minutes and an hour, depending on which Noel interview you watch. Just writing about whatever Noel saw or was going on around him at the time. But interestingly, that makes Supersonic fit in perfectly with this whole time capsule concept, because Noel was sat there writing about everything he saw in the studio. He was capturing that moment in time. So once again, it fits in with the flow of the album. And parts of the lyrics do seem to fit in with the idea that this is Oasis realising this could be it. They might be about to make it. I'm feeling supersonic. Give me gin and tonic. You can have it all, but how much do you want it? And I particularly like the lines, you need to find a way for what you want to say but before tomorrow, because that proves once again how absolutely literal and historical the song was. If you don't know the story, the band were in the studio, under pressure. They had to get a song recorded, and the sessions were going really badly. And they only had to the end of the day to get it done. They had to find a way for what they wanted to say, but before tomorrow. And so, Noel sat down and literally just wrote about everything that was going on around him, including a dog called Elsa, who apparently did terrible farts. So, in this whole concept of Definitely Maybe being a real-world record of what actually was going on historically with the band, Supersonic fits perfectly. Now, when it comes to the partner B-side for this song, I fudged things slightly just for this video and because I think it fits better. There was only one new original B-side on the Live Forever single, Cloudburst, which we've already used, but there is still one other unused song from this era that I'm going to put in the right-hand column and that's the vinyl-only track, Sad Song. I don't know for sure, but I've often thought that this song could have been written about the Amsterdam incident 
in February 1994. The whole band, except for Noel, got deported back to England and ended up missing a really important gig right in the earliest days where it might have ended up permanently damaging the band's careers. Liam, Bonehead, Gwigsy and McCarroll got collared on the ferry to Amsterdam for repeatedly shoplifting booze from the duty free and then attempting to buy more from the bar using a massive roll of forged £50 notes. And now, here's what Noel wrote in Sad Song round about that time. Where we're living in this town, the sun is coming up and it's going down, but it's all just the same at the end of the day. When we cheat and we lie, nobody says it's wrong, so we don't ask why. Don't throw it all away. Oasis were in the Pink Museum studios and wrote Supersonic in December 1993, and the Amsterdam incident took place in February 1994. So I kind of see these two songs, Supersonic and Sad Song, as sitting next to each other very comfortably in that historical record. On the 1994 vinyl version of the album, Sad Song actually came right after Columbia. I just put it here for no reason other than I just think it fits better. And bear in mind, I'm just doing this for fun. It's not deathly serious. It's not an academic paper. So let's move on now to the next album song, Bring It On Down. At this point, they were signed and trying to break through. And the lyrics to Bring It On Down talk about a sense of being shut out by powerful gatekeepers. They talk about being an outcast, being someone who is kept at arm's length because they are working class. There's a real sense of imposter syndrome, feeling like the uninvited guest at the party. You're the outcast, you're the underclass, but you don't care because you're living fast. You're the uninvited guest who stays till the end. I know you've got a problem that the devil sends. And now, let's put in the corresponding B-side. This is another absolutely outstanding B-side from this era. It's the song Listen Up, from the Cigarettes and Alcohol single. Listen up, what's the time? Said today I'm going to speak my mind. Take me up to the top of the world, I want to see my crime. Day by day, there's a man in a suit who's going to make you pay for the thoughts that you think and the words they won't let you say. So, there you have, in both songs, a sense of kind of being shut out, a sense of a high-class, high-powered man in a suit blocking you from saying what you want to say, or singing what you want to sing. Both of these tracks could be interpreted as Oasis battling to get recognition in a music scene in the early 90s, in which their sound look and attitude just didn't seem to fit. It's an experience many working class bands come up against, powerful music industry gatekeepers who hold them at arm's length because of what they sound like, what they look like and where they've come from. I don't know what you think, but I reckon these two songs, Bring It On Down and Listen Up, sit next to each other thematically, pretty much perfectly, once again. And now we move on to the last set of twin songs in this theoretical second act of Definitely Maybe. Track 8 is Cigarettes and Alcohol, and it's filled with the same sort of determination, drive, and sense of hope and new discovery as the other three songs on the album in this hypothetical second act. Is it my imagination, or have I finally found something worth living for? You could wait for a lifetime to spend your days in the sunshine, but you've got to make it happen. This song is really kind of grimy and gritty, but it's still bursting with that same kind of hope and aspiration that runs through the entire album from start to finish. You remember how the album opened with I Need Some Time in the Sunshine on track one? Well, here in the lyrics, it seems like Noel is saying I might be right on the edge of that dream of life in the sunshine coming true. If you just sit around and hope, it's not going to happen. But if you push every door, if you make it happen, it can. So, Cigarettes and Alcohol, the last album track in this kind of theoretical second act, is asking that question. Have I finally found something worth living for? Has Noel finally found that hidden key, that missing jigsaw piece that he was searching for in chapter one? This kind of made-up second act finishes with the next consecutive B-side, which is Fade Away. And once again, just like Alive rounded off act one, Fade Away feels like a closing statement to Act 2. It's like a conclusion in which he's looking back over all the ground we've covered so far and going right back to the opening scenes of his childhood. When I was young, I thought I had my own key. I knew exactly what I wanted to be. Now I'm sure you've boarded up every door. Lived in a bubble, days were never-ending. Was not concerned about what life was sending. Fantasy was real. 
Now I know much about the way I feel. Again, doesn't that sound a bit like he's referencing Rock and Roll Star again in these lyrics? He wrote the line, Tonight I'm a rock and roll star, when he absolutely was not one. Fantasy was real. And now, once again, let's look at how the lyrics to Fade Away match up to the lyrics from Cigarettes and Alcohol, thematically speaking. I'll paint you the picture, because I don't think you live round here no more. I've never even seen the key to the door. We only get what we will settle for. This seems to sit very comfortably next to the lines in Cigarettes and Alcohol where he says, you can wait for a lifetime to spend your days in the sunshine, but you've got to make it happen. And then we also have that line in Fade Away, I don't think you live round here no more. We could choose to see this historically as the point where Noel actually did get out of Manchester. If we accept that this song is telling us Noel has finally done it, he's finally managed to escape Manchester, it kind of makes sense of the chorus. He's moving out because if he stays, he's going to lose his dreams. And that matches directly to something we've already seen in Do You Want to Be a Spaceman? The town where we're living has made you a man and all of your dreams are washed away in the sand. He's got out of Manchester because he can't achieve his dreams if he stays. Fade Away continues, Now my life has turned another corner. I think it's only best that I should warn you. Dream it while you can. Maybe someday I'll make you understand. And so, just as Act 1 closed with Alive, saying the times are now changing, here Act 2 closes with Now My Life Has Turned Another Corner. And that's where I see the second act of the album coming to an end, on another cliffhanger, as we might expect. But we don't actually get any conclusion, any resolution to the story. Because after 8 or 16 songs about being a rock star and dreaming about making it big, in the third section or act, all of a sudden we get a collection of songs, back to back, all about a romantic relationship of some description. So now let's look at the third act, which I'm calling Louise. Why does the album suddenly have this incredibly jarring shift in theme? Only Noel Gallagher probably knows the answer to this, it may not even have been intentional. It could just have been happy coincidence that the last three tracks were grouped by the theme of relationships. Who knows? But... Remember what he said to Mojo. It's an honest snapshot of working class lads trying to make it. It's about shagging birds, taking drugs, drinking and the glory of all that. In the first two acts of the album, we've already had the bit about working class lads trying to make it. So this last part is about, as Noel puts it, birds. And when you remember that Noel has said this was kind of a snapshot in this interpretation of his own life, of course, he's put something of his love life in that snapshot. Track 9 on the album and the first track of this third act is a song that Digsy himself actually told me was written about a particularly gross fart he once did. And that's one of several farts referenced on the album. When you look at the lyrics however, in the context of the album, this is the main character, presumably Noel, inviting someone over for a date. What a life it would be if you could come to mine for tea. I'll pick you up at half past three, we'll have lasagna. I'll treat you like a queen, I'll give you strawberries and cream, then your friends will all go green for my lasagna. It's just a kind of goofy little pop song, but it functions as an introduction to this section. So if we look at what we've got so far, that second act has mostly been a chronological story of the early days of the band. If we assume this third act is talking about Noel and his then partner Louise, we could see this as his first date. And it leads us into the final two songs on the album. Track 10 is Slide Away, possibly the best track on Definitely Maybe, potentially Liam Gallagher's greatest ever vocal performance in the 90s, and probably the song most often voted for by the public as the greatest thing Oasis ever committed to tape. Noel has confirmed in multiple places that this song was written about his then girlfriend, Louise Jones. The woman closest to him at this point was Louise Jones. Noel had seen her around in various clubs, mainly the Hacienda, and they eventually got chatting. Soon they decided to live together. Louise was a manager at a Benetton shop in town, and she had put her name down for a flat in India House, a large building situated in the city centre. According to Oasis Mythology, Slide Away was written by Noel Gallagher on Johnny Marr's guitar at the Mono Valley Recording Studios during the first Definitely Maybe sessions. And I view this song very much as a summing up of his feelings towards her. This is very much a love song, 
capturing, as if in a diary, the intensity of feeling he then had towards his partner. Hold me down. All the world's asleep. I need you now. You've knocked me off my feet. I dream of you and we talk of growing old. But you said please don't. Now that you're mine, we'll find a way of chasing the sun. Let me be the one who shines with you. In the morning we don't know what to do. We're two of a kind. We'll find a way to do what we've done. Let me be the one who shines with you, and we can slide away. I don't know, I don't care. All I know is you'll take me there. The whole song is full of a really intense passion, but it's also a little bit dark in places, as if they might be battling through hard times. And the idea that they were in love, but also kind of on the rocks, is borne out by Bonehead in an interview with Paolo Hewitt at the time. As for Noel's relationship with Louise, someone like Bonehead found it hard to fathom out. By the time Noel had joined Oasis, a lot of the money he earned as a roadie, and by all accounts he had received good wages, went on either enjoyment or equipment. It was left to Louise to cover the rent and bring in the shopping. According to Wikipedia, he described them as soulmates, and when they finally split up in June 1994, Noel said, I don't think I'll ever get over it. So it was, by all accounts, an intense but often unhappy relationship. And, just like Rock and Roll Star, there's not a whole lot of mystery to these lyrics. Noel has just come out and told us they're about Louise. But that brings us on now to the last song on the album. We've had a couple getting together for a date on track 9. We've had a love song from Noel to his girlfriend on track 10. And now, track 11, the final song, is Married With Children. And I reckon this is kind of the reverse of Slide Away. Slide Away was from Noel to Louise, and I think this is Noel's version of a song from Louise to Noel. There was something awry in Noel's life, but it was nothing to do with music. It concerned Louise. The relationship was breaking down, and Noel wanted out. It was funny, Bonehead said. You'd go round to pick Noel up to go rehearsing, and Louise would just turn up with the shopping as we were leaving. They'd just kind of nod to each other, and then go their separate ways. One night they had an argument, and Louise told Noel that the band he was in was crap, and the music he wrote was shite. Noel picked that line up straight away. And of course, your music's shite, it keeps me up all night, is one of the most memorable lines from this song. And when you pull the camera back a bit and look at all the lyrics to this song, it's basically an angry monologue from one person in a relationship to the other. And knowing that that line was said by Louise to Noel, it's not a huge stretch to assume that all of this is meant to be Louise to Noel. In reality, it might be, it might not, but for the purposes of this video and interpretation, let's say that it is. There's no need for you to say you're sorry. Goodbye, I'm going home. I don't care no more, so don't you worry. Goodbye, I'm going home. I hate the way that even though you know you're wrong, you say you're right. I hate the books you read and all your friends. Your music's shite, it keeps me up all night. And now, listen to this from Bonehead. You'd go round there, Bonehead recalls, and Noel, who would be something like four grand behind with the rent, would have all his mates round to watch football. They'd be drinking beer, shouting, and meanwhile, Louise would be in bed trying to get some kip to go to work the next day so that she could pay the rent. So, with things being that lopsided in the relationship, with Noel pretty much doing nothing to contribute to the running of the household, and even staying up late and sabotaging her as she tried to carry the whole lot on her shoulders, you can kind of see how these lyrics could very reasonably be directed at Noel. Now, you may have noticed that at this point we have officially run out of B-sides. For this theory to work, we need another song to go opposite Diggsy's Dinner. But, as it turns out, there actually is another, definitely maybe era B-side, but it's potentially not the one you're expecting. The next Oasis single is Whatever, and two of the B-sides from that single actually belong with the next album. They were written about the Morning Glory story, and they were written in that era. But there is one B-side on Whatever that is pretty unique in this time, that actually sits with this body of work. And strangely enough, it's the album version of Slide Away. Slide Away appeared not just as the 10th track on Definitely Maybe, but also as the final Definitely Maybe era B-side. So, in a strange twist of coincidence, by sticking to the same system, we can in fact put Slide Away here, in the right-hand column. But, 
there is still one more song that I would like to add to the running order, just to be a completionist. And that's one of the tracks that was recorded round about a similar time, and appears on the Whitfield Street demos along with Definitely Maybe. And that song is Whatever. We know that the song Whatever was written by Noel in this phase of his life. They even recorded their first demo of it with the real people before they'd even released their first single, so it does belong with these songs. And fitting this last song in with this kind of double album concept, some people will think this is a bit of a stretch. And maybe it is, but I'm putting it in here anyway because it feels like a much better ending and neater conclusion, a bit more satisfying to the final act than Married With Children. So listen to what Noel says here about that period of songwriting when he was living in India House. I remember writing it in my flat in Manchester and two guys used to live above me. And on those days, the fucking geezer that I was, I used to write on the electric guitar with me amp in the fucking room in a block of flats on 10. And Bonehead used to always be the fucking tut tutter, didn't he? Sick guy, you know, yeah. I remember coming out, I've got a tune called whatever. Whatever. So he was writing cigarettes and alcohol and whatever in exactly the same period. He pretty much mentions them in the same sentence there. And this was all from the same era when he was pissing off the neighbours by playing the riff loudly at night. And do you remember what Bonehead said? Who else was getting pissed off by Noel making a racket on the guitar at night? Louise. The riff he talked about playing late at night was cigarettes and alcohol, and that's a blues riff. It in fact opens with one of the most famous and widely used blues vamps in history. So now, look at the first two lines of whatever in the context of people complaining about Noel playing cigarettes and alcohol, a blues riff, loud, late at night. I'm free to be whatever I choose, and I'll sing the blues if I want. The song goes on. I'm free to say whatever I like. If it's wrong or right, it's all right. The whole song seems like a kind of reaction, almost a retaliation, to the sentiments in Married With Children. He seems to be saying, stop telling me what to do. I will live my life as I please. The song Whatever is a funny one, because it could easily have been interpreted as a song just about the broad subject, the general principle of freedom. And that's exactly what I would have thought it was if it wasn't for the lyrics in the middle section. The one part of the song that just doesn't sit right with the idea of broad sweeping themes and comments on society. This little section of lyrics sounds like the whole thing is actually being aimed at a specific person, someone who used to know him well, but now all the fun has gone out of the relationship. Here in my mind, you know you might find something that you thought you once knew, but now it's all gone, and you know it's no fun, and I know it's no fun. What the hell has that got to do with broad themes of freedom in society? I reckon we could choose in this interpretation to view whatever as his response to Louise. I think we could view this four song final act of the album as a little snapshot of the start and the end of that relationship. When you remember that this was written in his India house phase when he lived with Louise and you add in the context of them fighting all the time over his music and his lifestyle, a song saying I will sing whatever I want and do whatever I want suddenly starts to take on a little more of a pointed meaning. If you choose to interpret the album and b-sides this way, whatever, which was chronologically speaking the final track to be released from these sessions, you could see the story ending with how it actually did in real life. Noel saying I'm unhappy in this relationship, I want to be free, this is no fun so I'm off to start the next chapter of my life. So that's how I reckon you could choose to group the tracks on this album and the b-sides, if you want to. In reality, I've no idea whether Noel did or didn't put these songs together in that order intentionally. But whether you think there is planning and intention in these track orders or not, it is nonetheless amazing to see how single-mindedly focused Noel was back then in his early days, to the point that practically every song he wrote in that era seemed to bleed with the passion and desperation to escape Manchester and make it as a rock star. But now, let's finish up by taking a look at the title. Definitely maybe. The whole story of the album seems to hinge on the constant question, will he make it, won't he make it? Both in the context of the band, will they make it to be rock stars, and also in the context at the end of Nolan Louise, will they make it as a couple? 
And of course, we never actually get the resolution to either story in the album itself. Both questions are just left hanging in the air. Similarly to Morning Glory, it was kind of written about reality. So what was actually happening in the world in real time? So the story has no ending on the album, either happy or sad, because it literally hadn't happened yet in the real world. And this is why I reckon the album was called Definitely Maybe. Will they achieve their dreams? Will the story of the album have a happy ending? They most definitely have a shot. Definitely maybe. Maybe yes, maybe no. And as it happened, it was yes to the band and no to Louise. The fitting answer to the contradictory title Definitely Maybe was the answer both yes and no. And so that's it. That's my theory of the interpretation of the lyrics to Definitely Maybe and how they function inside the mega trilogy of the first three Oasis albums. Let me know down in the comments if you might add anything else to this interpretation. If you think I'm reading way too much into it, you could be right. I don't hold this up as fact, just a hopefully entertaining bit of content, that's all. But as always, it's been great fun putting these things together and finding the interesting connections between this body of work and what was actually going on in real life in the world of Noel Gallagher, whether it's there by design or not. So if you can see anything else that I might have missed, let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you next time.